Drum roll, please. After much delay, here are the pre-departure session slides made available to you for the UF in London Class Internship Spring 2020 program. Uh, there's hopefully some useful information here respecting things that you should do before you go and things to do once you get there. Uh, this is in no way meant to be exhaustive. Um, I know you're receiving information from a lot of different sources. FIE is in touch with you. Everything they send to you will be really important, very spot on in terms of its relevance to you. Uh, the International Center here at UF has also been in communication with you and they have a lot of useful resources and information to share. So I'm gonna to try to keep this short and sweet. Um, and as, as I said, not exhaustive. If you have any questions, feel free to be in touch with Christine Richmond or me, Joe Orster. Um, in terms of the structure of uh, the slideshow, the first half will be devoted to nitty gritty details about this semester in London. The second half will be focused on more general issues of what you can do to get the most out of your study abroad experience. I hope you'll make the time to uh, listen to both of these sessions and try to think through some of the information that we're sharing with you. Uh, enough preamble, let's get on to the slides. If you're planning to use financial aid, there's a couple of things you should do before you head out of the States to London. Um, verify with Student Financial Affairs that your financial file is complete. Um, make sure that everything there is in order. That'll help smooth things out when you're overseas. If you're using Florida prepaid, be sure to complete the University of Florida International Center prepaid form for transfer credit hours. The hours that you will earn as part of this program are transfer credit, and as such, they require a little bit more paperwork. Um, this form is available on the International Center website. Lastly, financial aid will be dispersed no earlier than 10 days before the program start date. Not all of the aid will be dispersed at the same time, and in fact, some of your aid may be dispersed after the semester begins. Just keep those things in mind. Um, be on the lookout for new developments. Uh, if you have any questions with respect to uh, financial aid, be sure to contact June Bristol at the University of Florida International Center. Before you go, disability resources. Um, by this point, you should really have already disclosed any requested accommodations for FIE directly on the FIE uh, application. Um, if you did not uh, request these accommodations or disclose any accommodations needed, um, be sure to do that as soon as you can, like right now. Don't wait until you get to London because FIE may need some time in order to kind of uh, prepare the, uh, the accommodations required. If uh, accommodations are required, then you will need to pre-register with Disability Resource Center here at UF. Uh, DRC will issue a study abroad accommodation letter, um, and then you can present that to um, FIE. If you have any questions about access accessibility needs in London, contact Hannah Feeks, who is FIE's Director of Administration and Accessibility. Um, and I should add that FIE is committed to a comprehensive policy of equal opportunities, and their programs are tailored to give access to the widest possible student representation. So they're working to um, address whatever type of need you may have. One last thing before you go, the tier four visa. This is the document that allows you to intern in the United Kingdom if you do not have EU citizenship. Um, by this point, you really should have completed all the tasks on your end that are involved with getting your visa. And now you're either waiting or some of you, you've already got it back. If you're asked for more information from the United Kingdom Visas and Immigration, otherwise known as YUCVI, comply with their request. If your visa is refused, contact FIE's Immigration Compliance Officer as soon as you can. Her name is Estelle Ritter. All right, now we're out of the United States and getting onto the fun stuff. Um, how to get into the United Kingdom. Uh, when you land in London, you will pass through UK passport control. Uh, if you are arriving on a US passport with a tier four visa, you have a choice. You can either go 
enter the country through an automated e-gate or you can enter through a manned immigration desk. If you choose the automated e-gate, you will scan your U.S. passport to enter the United Kingdom. You won't necessarily talk with anyone unless there's any issues as having difficulty scanning your passport for whatever reason. You will not receive an entry stamp on your passport. And if you do not receive an entry stamp on your passport, you must retain your boarding pass as proof that you entered the UK while your visa was valid. And that's underlined on the slide here for a reason. It's really important. If you're entering on a U.S. passport with a Tier 4 visa and you choose the manned immigration desk, um, it will require you to uh, interact with uh, an official there at the border. Um, they may or may not give you a, an entry stamp. They may just wave you through. Um, if you do not receive an entry stamp on your passport, you must retain your boarding pass as proof that you entered the UK while your visa was valid. So if you're entering on a US passport and you do not receive an entry stamp, be sure to keep your boarding pass. And this is important to know ahead of time so that you hold on to that boarding pass after you get on the plane. Don't just discard it or forget it on the plane or something like that. If you have dual EU citizenship um, and you're entering on an EU passport, you did not get a Tier 4 visa, use the automated e-gate, scan your e or EU passport when you enter the United Kingdom. I don't think you'll need to keep your boarding pass uh, for immigration purposes, but it's always fun to keep boarding passes as a souvenir, so hold on to it just in case. Um, remember, um, Whenever you're going through immigration, customs, that sort of thing, it's in your best interest to treat any immigration official or customs official with uh, respect. Um, these people have a lot of power over whether or not you actually enter the country and under what circumstances, so always be respectful. Unfortunately, you will be spending money regularly, primarily on food, but also on entertainment and personal travel. Here are some things you can do uh, to help you spend your money without too much hassle. Uh, first, you will be using a debit card or a credit card frequently. So before you go, notify your bank and or your credit card company that you'll be going overseas. Some banks allow you to do this online. Others you might have to call or visit. But it's important to do this because otherwise you run the risk of having your account frozen. Um, when the powers that be see that your card is being used in far off parts of the world and they get concerned and they'll put a freeze on your account. Um, to avoid that, notify your bank uh, or your credit card company ahead of time where you're going. Once you get into London, go ahead and visit an ATM in the airport so that you'll have some pounds in hand. Note that there will also be currency exchange booths in the airport and also there's plenty around FIE's Kensington campus. So if you have dollars that you want to exchange, you will have that chance. But if possible, try to avoid exchanging money in the airport. The rates just aren't that good. Um, when you are using your debit card or your credit card, be aware of fees. There may be withdrawal fees associated with a local bank um, and your own bank uh, or credit card company may also charge fees. So just be aware of that. The fee is usually the same whether you're withdrawing $100 or $300. So it's best to plan your ATM withdrawals accordingly and try to take out larger sums less frequently. When you're notifying your bank of your travel plans, you might also ask them what the maximum withdrawal amount per day is, just so you have that information handy. Lastly, and this may be just me, but get familiar with the coin denominations. They come in various sizes and colors and weights. Um, and try to use the change before you use bills when possible, only because otherwise the coins really do pile up. It's they're really quite heavy. Um, it's a hassle to carry that around, and it's just best to get rid of them as soon as you can. Um, otherwise, I'm sure all of you know how to spend money just dandy, so I won't go into any further detail with respect to this. Planning personal travel. I'm sure you've already bought your plane tickets, right? 
Uh, so I won't necessarily cover that. Uh, you'll be able to check into FIE housing on January 8th. You'll have to check out on April 26th. Uh, don't plan any personal travel until you arrive in London and receive a list of confirmed dates. Don't plan any travel for the weekend of February 7 to 9th. That weekend is reserved for a cultural excursion to Belfast, Northern Ireland. This trip is required. FIE will be sharing more details with you about this trip. I can tell you that all costs are covered, including round trip airfare to Belfast, on ground transportation, lodging, entrance fees, and all meals. It sounds like FIE has planned an exciting itinerary for this uh, excursion. Uh, more details will follow, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, you'll have plenty of time uh, to, to travel both around the United Kingdom and around Europe. Notice the break week, uh, which is spring break. Um, that's an opportunity for that most students take advantage of to do some sort of travel on the continent. So um, keep your eyes open for opportunities, but be aware that there are some dates that you will not be allowed to travel. You know by now how the semester is organized. Most of the coursework happens in the first seven weeks. The second seven weeks are devoted to internships as well as the continuation of the key course. Excursions into London are built into each course that you take, and uh, many of these courses are designed to expose you to a variety of different neighborhoods and cultures within metropolitan London. There's gonna be lots of opportunities to travel around the city. It will be extraordinary fun. But keep in mind that these are academic endeav endeavors. Uh, the folks at FIE are very serious about enforcing attendance, encouraging participation, submitting you, submitting assignments. Um, you're not in London just for fun, you're there to learn. Also keep in mind that your British professors may have a very different teaching style from what you're used to. You will need to adjust. If you ever run into any academic difficulties, don't be afraid to take advantage of the counseling and tutoring services that FIE provides. They are there to help you stay on track. Of course, the main attraction this semester abroad is the internship. This is why you're going. You can't help but get really excited about the prospect of interning in London. And if you're not excited, I'm really excited for you. Um, but our partners in London are very firm that we should temper our excitement and bring down our expectations just a couple of notches. Um, the placements generally will be at small and medium-sized companies that you've never heard of. And that's okay. In fact, it's great. In a smaller firm, you'll have a greater chance to do a greater variety of more meaningful tasks. And that's what you want. A smaller firm will also allow you to engage with your coworkers in a more meaningful way. Remember, uh, the internship is as much an intercultural experience as a professional one, and you should approach it as such. Um, having said that, remember that professionalism can be cultural too, and professionalism will be expected of you. This means appropriate dress and appropriate behavior. Um, for the interview, FIE requires you to wear a formal outfit, and most of you will be wearing business casual as part of the daily grind. Um, appropriate behavior. Take note of how people interact and talk to each other. What terms of address are used? What body language? That's as much cultural as it is um, anything else. Interestingly, FIE also considers the consumption of alcohol part of the professionalization process. The drinking age in London is 18. Um, there will be events with free drinks. You may be going to pubs after work with your coworkers. Drink responsibly. Don't drink to get drunk, as American college students are often want to do. Instead, drink with control to socialize, as professional Londoners do. Um, there will be more mundane stuff that you'll have to take care of as part of the internship as well. There will be paperwork involved. Immigration conditions require you to submit performance appraisals and weekly timesheets. Um, 
There will be coursework involved. The internship is attached to a three credit international internship course that will require you to reflect on and respond to the experience. Um, and also you'll have an internship mentor to help you make the most of this time, uh, this professional training, this intercultural training that you're uh, going to London for. So during your semester in London, you're going to be taking classes with other American students. You're going to be interning in an English language environment. You may not be expecting to experience culture shock, but history shows you will. At some point during the semester, culture shock will hit you. And so I want to talk briefly about the various stages of culture shock and also about you know, why it's important for you to be aware of these things. If you want to hit pause here and read this table in more detail, feel free to do that. Um, this is taken from the FIE website, which also has its own resources with respect to culture shock. And so, uh, you know, take take note of this, but I'm going to kind of talk through each stage briefly and then move on to some other stuff related to culture shock. Um, of the four stages, stage one is always called the honeymoon stage. This is usually during the first few days or weeks. People experience emotions like excitement, euphoria, anticipation, eagerness. Um, everything you do, everyone you meet is new and exciting. It's a great time to be alive. Um, stage two here, they call it the hostility stage. I've also seen it referred to as the frustration stage. Um, but this stage can result in difficulty sleeping, in sadness, homesickness, exhaustion, increased worry, a desire to withdraw, uh, unexplained crying, overeating. Um, it's characterized as, as the chart here says by frustration, anger, anxiety, and sometimes depression. Uh, it's important to keep in mind when you experience these feelings, um, talk to someone. Uh, talk to your classmates who will be in a unique position to empathize um, and help out because they're, they may be going through these issues at the same time you are. Talk with the FIE staff who um, many of them have studied abroad similar to you and, and have experienced these in the past. All of them are trained to help you deal with this. Um, you're going to find it's not going to be as useful probably to talk with friends back home or with family back home because they don't know what you're experiencing. They may not have experienced this. They won't be able to empathize the way that people who are there with you will be. And so keep that in mind. Stage two, it's frustrating, but there's also an opportunity for you to kind of talk to people, make new connections, learn from it. Stage three, the humor stage. Um, also called the adjustment stage. During this stage, people become more familiar and comfortable with the culture, the people, the food of the host country. Um, you're li you'll likely feel less homesick. homesick. Um, you'll have made friends that you can rely on for support, and you're going to find out that you can better handle the situations that you previously found uh, quite frustrating. And then the fourth stage, uh, the humor stage, or the home stage, I'm sorry, the home stage or the acceptance stage. At this point, you're going to be able to compare the good and the bad of your host country with the good and the bad of your home country. You should feel a lot less like a foreigner um, and view your host country more as a second home. Uh, students, you're going to have the satisfaction of knowing that you can live successfully in two cultures, which is a huge milestone. That will happen near the end and once you hit that stage you're going to be really sad then to leave and you'll experience another culture shock when you return home. Um, be prepared for that. Uh, it's important to know about these stages of culture shock for a couple of reasons. First, being aware of these stages helps you be aware of your state of mind, helps you recognize what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Um, just keep in mind that these stages are perfectly natural. The frustration, anger, and anxiety that you'll feel, it's to be expected. Everyone is going through this. And, you know, so don't think, A, don't think you're, it's, it's un, unnatural or weird for you to be feeling this way. But, but B, also, when you do feel that way, you know, seek out help. Talk to others. 
Second, it's also useful to know about these stages of culture shock so that you can prepare for how to deal with them. Um, especially helpful will be setting goals ahead of time for yourself. If you find yourself feeling a little culture shock or homesick, what do you want to see? Where do you want to go? What types of events do you hope to attend? Um, the next part of the slideshow presentation will be geared especially to help you with setting some of these goals and to help you plan to get the most you can out of your experience abroad. But it's important to plan for this because if you let the hostility stage uh, derail your experience, um, you'll find that you know in some ways it would have been a wasted semester. And so you, when you hit that stage two, you want to be prepared for how are you going to kind of work through it. And a good way to do that is to take stock of the larger picture.